Hey, what's up, everybody? Dorn Aldana here coming at you with another kick-ass episode of the Art of Mortgage Marketing Podcast. Super jacked and stacked to give you guys another hard-hitting, high-impact episode. And today we're going to talk about how to cultivate massive confidence to close more deals with less effort and to be able to create the life you want by design versus drifting by default to be able to create what you want and to be able to show up in power, even in the face of challenging circumstances, even in the face of the storms of life, to be able to show up in power with confidence, with certainty, with peace of mind, and to be at cause in your life versus at the effect of. So I know without a shadow of a doubt, this is going to be one of my most challenging topics to cover, not because I don't know how to source and cultivate confidence, uh, but because I'm going to be really vulnerable with you guys, I'm going to share my journey with you. And uh, frankly, being vulnerable is not easy for me. I'm learning to flex that muscle and build that muscle. But I've been in a habit of pretending for a long time, pretending to have it all figured out, pretending uh, that, you know, I've got all these things just nailed down. Everything's perfect. Everything's cool. And creating kind of a facade that I've got it all figured out because I've lived under this belief that I have to have it all figured out. Otherwise, people aren't going to like me, love me, be led by me, want to be led by me. And I have believed this BS lie that I have to live this facade of having it all figured out. Otherwise, I'm going to be just one of those imposters that no one's going to want to be influenced by. And frankly, that lie has been stealing me of my power because that pretense and that pretending, that's not genuine, powerful, spirit-led and servant-led leadership. That's this in, you know, really incongruent uh, and in, um, where's the word? The word is really just not being fully aligned, being fully genuine with me being human me being in my humanity. So I'm going to share some of my journey with you that I have a feeling will really have an impact for you. And even as, as I'm sharing this, you notice a little wobble there because frankly, this is a little bit of a new domain for me. I'm taking new risks. And frankly, that's one of the areas where we can build confidence is to take risks outside of our comfort zone. Yes, it's scary. Yes, it can feel very vulnerable and exposing. And sometimes we can feel naked in taking those bold risks. But on the other side of that risk, there's reward. On the other side of that risk, there's an opportunity to step into our humanity in seeking progress, not perfection, and to just say, screw it, let's do it. And just go out there and build muscle by virtue of not having it all figured out. You see, we build muscle not by lifting weights that are comfortable, not by building weights that we've always done before that are easy, breezy, lemon, squeezy. We build muscle by lifting weight heavier than what feels comfortable, heavier than what we're used to. And that's how we step into the best version of ourselves. So why even bother talking about confidence? Well, right now in the mortgage market, obviously there's a lot of stuff going on that's stealing our confidence, right? We've got a uh, massive market shift from a seller's market moving towards a buyer's market, from a refi market moving towards a purchase market, low inventory, hyper competition, margin compression. There's a lot going on right now, right? And on top of that, rates going up. So a lot of people I'm stuck, speaking to and uh, connecting with in this uh, crazy marketplace, they're struggling. You know, they were kicking ass and taking names just a couple of years back, even last year. And a lot of people who are coming to us now are earning a fraction of what they used to make. Some people even one third, one fourth of what they used to make. They're looking at their pipeline. It's looking rather anemic in comparison to what they're used to. Uh, the deals are hard to come by now. They're noticing that if they were on a one-legged stool with 90% refis, that refi market for the most part has been dried up. And now they're all trying to clamor after the same realtors and they're not feeling the confidence 
that they once had. Maybe their mojo, their swagger factor, their self-esteem, their self-worth has started to drain down through the toilet because they don't have the closings, they don't have the volume, the phone's not ringing. And when their volume goes down the toilet, their confidence goes down with it. Perhaps you can relate. So, you know, obviously to kick this conversation off, a big question begging to be asked is why does confidence matter? Well, it matters because your confidence is what allows you to source everything you do, right? If you're going and trying to connect with realtors, your confidence will either attract or repel depending on the transmit the, the frequency you're transmitting. Are you transmitting certainty? Or are you transmitting the lack thereof, right? Are you transmitting confidence? Or are you transmitting the lack thereof? Same with borrowers. Right now, a lot of borrowers are shaking in their boots. Right now, they're tentative. A lot of people have the proclivity to sit on the fence. Let's just see what happens. Rates are going up. Maybe they'll go back down. Maybe I'll just wait. So people are living in this you know, black cloud of uncertainty. And it's your job to be a merchant of certainty and to be the light in the darkness for these people. But if you don't have confidence, you're part of the darkness. You're not part of the problem. You're not part of the solution. You're part of the problem. And so certainty is everything. Confidence is everything. Now, does that mean you have to be perfect? Hell no. I just talked about that, right? My pretense of trying to have it all together and this, you know, BS belief that if people knew the real me, they wouldn't want to be led by me. They wouldn't want to be my friend. They wouldn't want to be influenced by me. It was complete hogwash BS, but I was believing it. And it was having me live in a lie that had me have this pretense that was not allowing me to live in my power. And so there's lots of different factors that steal our peace, steal our power and steal our confidence. But when we have our confidence, we're in our power. When we lack confidence, we're in lack, limitation, and scarcity. We leech and leak our power. And so it's really important. You want to turn adversity into opportunity. You want to be you know, competing in the marketplace and kicking ass and taking names and chewing bubble gum and crushing it. You want to be able to lead your team in the promised land if you have a team. You want to be able to attract more you know, top producing realtors to make you their exclusive. You know, you want to be able to build a dream team of rock star realtors who send you all their business all the time. You want to close more deals and create prosperity, even in unprosperous times. That's going to take you living in your power, friends. And when you're feeling powerless, that's synonymous to lacking confidence. True or not true. So confidence is at the heartbeat of our ability to create. When we're in fear, when we're lacking confidence, we contract. Now, if you're a painter and you have your painting appendages, your, append your painting tools in contraction mode, right? So let's imagine that you're trying to create and paint with a fist. Good luck. You have to relax that hand and you have to put the tool of your brush or the tool of your pencil whatever your artistic tool might be in a relaxed, dexterous posture of creativity. That's an expansive posture, right? We expand into creativity. We don't contract into uh, creativity. That would be fight, flight, or freeze. So we're in, we're in contraction. We're not in creativity. We're in, we're in this self-preservation mode. But when we expand, we're like an expansive lotus flower. We expand into creativity. And so we want to get ourselves more into that expansive energy, into an energy where we're creating something new, not hashing, rehashing the same old stuff, doing the same old thing and getting the same old results. But we're in creativity, innovation. We're becoming the best version of ourselves. We're coming up with new, creative, innovative ways to add value, to serve, to make an impact, to excel, to become the dust on top of outstanding, right? And to do that, it creates a lot of, it requires a lot of creativity. And that's why we need to be in faith, not fear. So that's why confidence matters. Confidence matters because without confidence, we lack creativity. Without creativity, we lack the ability to create something new. If we're not creating anything new, guess what we're doing? We're stagnating. And guess what happens when we stagnate? We breed rot, right? 
you see a body of water and it's stagnant, that is not water you want to swim in, right? That's in some nasty water. It's got duck poo in it. It's got all kinds of nasty. And you jump in that water, you're going to get sick. Or at the very least, you're going to get all itchy and it's going to be a special kind of nasty for probably a few days because stagnation breeds rot. And the spout under which all the good stuff pours out is in fresh creativity, the fresh water of creativity, the fresh water of innovation, the fresh water of being light in the darkness, serving others from a place of certainty, confidence, and being other person focused to serve another another soul, another few human being out of their problem and into their solution. So let me just share a little bit about my journey. I said I was going to be vulnerable. So here we go. Buckle up. <laughs> so truth be told, many of you may not know this, but I you what lack of confidence looks like from my own personal journey. I can tell you that who you see and who you hear today, the Dorn Aldana you see and hear today is not the Dorn Aldana I once was. You see, when I was in high school, they called me bathroom boy because I literally went to the bathroom like 20 times a day. I kid you not. Any chance I could get, I go to the bathroom. Why is that? Not to go potty, not to go pee. It's not because I you know, had an issue with my bladder or my bowels. It's because I was very insecure. I felt that I was not enough. I didn't look right. My hair wasn't quite right. Things weren't quite right. But I felt that if I can just get my hair just right, then people will like me. Then the girls will like me. Then the dudes will think I'm a cool cat. That I'm, and, and it gave me a sense of control where I felt like I can control a certain degree of my confidence just by how I looked. And so I'd go into the bathroom and I'd pretend that I'm washing my hands after going to the washroom. But instead, what I was I doing? I was getting everything just right, getting my hair just right, you know, getting my everything just dialed right in, right? Everything just right, priming. And so I literally would spend hours in little bits and pieces through the day trying to get my hair just right, getting things, everything just dialed right in. Totally narcissistic, right? Navel gazing and being totally self-focused. And notice that that's kind of how it works, right? When we're navel gazing, when we're narcissistic, when we're self-focused, that's a great way to breed insecurities and a great way to expand those insecurities. And it's a great way to perpetuate those insecurities and to lack confidence because it's just a coping mechanism. It's a coping mechanism that perpetuates the paradigm that's at the source of the problem. So they called me bathroom boy. I remember one day coming out of the bathroom after going to PE, physical education, and there was an assembly. So they rang the bell for the assembly and I didn't realize that there was an assembly. I thought it was just break time. Little did I know, there was an assembly on the other side of that door. So when I finally got my hair just right, or at least I gave up on trying to get it right, I opened the door and to my absolute horror, I see the entire school assembly in front of me, looking directly at me, the bathroom boy coming out of the bathroom. <laughs> so you can imagine how horrified I was, right? But of course I pretend everything's cool. Cool as a cucumber, right? I do an about face to the right. I head out of the, the gym and I turn left down the hall and I inconspicuously, or at least so I thought, re-enter the gym and join the assembly. But of course, everyone's like, there he is again, bathroom boy. So this was my childhood. This was my high school years. Feeling this insecurity just corrupting my soul, but not really knowing how to fix it and feeling inadequate. I couldn't look someone in the eye. I remember there was this guy that I thought was really cool in school and his name was Jesse. And, you know, he was kind of a buddy, but I didn't really feel like I measured up. So I felt inadequate and insecure and I couldn't look him in the eye. I remember those days feeling that insecurity. Even recently over the last 10 years, I remember going to the grocery store and feeling 
inadequate and insecure to even have a conversation with the teller, the cashier, right? Like the cashier was there and I just felt this insecurity. And I I remember self-monitoring myself saying, don't mess up. Don't trip on your lips. Don't stutter. And guess how that goes, right? When you're focusing on don't stutter, don't mess up. What do you tend to do? You mess up, you stutter because where your attention goes, your energies flow and results show. And so wherever you focus on is what you expand, what you focus on, you feed and what you feed expands and gets stronger. So this lack of confidence uh, has really been a struggle for me. So I'm not here saying I have it all figured out. What I can say is that over time, I've learned how to get past those prisons of my own making, to liberate myself from that prison of my own making and to step into a more expansive space of certainty, of confidence, of living in my power and living in self-acceptance and allowing myself to be human and to step into my humanity and to give myself a lot more grace. Am I perfect? Hell no. But I've noticed that there's certain specific things that I've done either consciously or unconsciously that have allowed me to liberate myself from that prison of my own making. And I'm going to share some of those with you today. So if you can relate to some of those insecurities, if you can relate to some of those confidence hemorrhaging experiences, welcome to the club. You're in good company. Welcome to being human on the front lines of real life, right? So let me share with you three common ways we kill our own confidence. Three different ways we kill our own confidence. The first is delusional optimism, delusional optimism. So this is kind of like hope prison, right? It's kind of like you've never seen really anything that you're doing really work. You're constantly putting band-aids on the situation when you need surgery and you're kind of head and east looking for the sunset. But you think if I can just take a few more steps, if I just keep persisting, if I keep plodding along, eventually things will pan out. Eventually I'll see the sunset, right? Or you're heading to the gunfight and you're like, yeah, I have the butter knife. I'm wielding the butter knife at the gunfight. Um, But, you know, if I just work longer and harder, if I grind just a little longer and harder, eventually I will see victory. Right. How well do you think that's going to work? Not very well. Right. So delusional optimism creates this false sense of security because it's a coping mechanism because we don't want to face the eye of the tiger and face the truth. So we kind of ostrich ourselves, stick our head in the sand, ostrich ourselves from the truth by telling ourselves these softeners like it's not so bad. You know, other people have it worse. And we kind of feel like that's just, you know, gratitude. Like I'm just, you know, I'm being, I'm just a, I have the attitude of gratitude. I'm being positive. No, you're fucking telling yourself a lie. Right. And tell it unless you tell yourself the truth, you're never going to set yourself free. The truth shall set you free. It's kind of like the fat guy who goes to a personal trainer and the personal trainer says, so, you know, how committed are you to to getting in shape? How committed are you to, uh, you know, to getting out of being fat and getting into being fit? And the guy says, well, I'm not fat. I'm just big boned. Right? No, you're freaking fat. <laughs> and until and unless you tell yourself the truth, you're never going to get fit. So that's delusional optimism, right? And what that does is it creates a coping mechanism where you kind of lie to yourself enough that you kind of feel this crutch of certainty, this crutch of confidence, but it crumbles when the shit hits the fan. It crumbles when you face adversity. It crumbles when you're all by yourself and you're realizing, oh shit, my trajectory is not looking good. It crumbles when you're trying to get it sleep to sleep at night and you realize that wielding the the butter knife at the gunfight is not working and you don't really have a basis for confidence. You don't have a solid foundation for confidence. So it crumbles because it's a house built on sand, not on a solid rock foundation. So delusional optimism is that sand. It's not based on truth. It does not have a solid foundation. And because of that, it creates this wobbly need experience where you have a crutch of the story you tell yourself to cope. 
But because it's not a solid foundation, it does not give you soul strength. It does not give you enduring soul strength, especially in the face of a storm. And that has you leaking confidence. It has you less certain, less confident than you could or should be. And so that's one of the ways we kill our confidence is not telling ourselves the truth, not getting real with the truth. Because as Jesus said, the truth shall set you free. What he didn't say is going to piss you freaking off, chances are, because it's uncomfortable. It's exposing. It causes one to feel naked many times. It requires us to be humble and exercise courageous vulnerability. That's not easy for human beings to be courageously vulnerable. We don't like that. We get squeamish. We squirm in our chair, even the the mere thought of it, right? But that's what it really takes to step into freedom. We have to exercise critical thinking and we have to face the eye, the tiger of the truth. The truth shall set you free, but first is probably going to piss you right off. And such to pay to step into your power. So confidence killer number two is focusing on fear. Focusing on fear. So fear has many different faces, right? Sometimes fear is afraid of failure, afraid of success, afraid of what people think, afraid of being broke, afraid of not being able to pay the bills, afraid of what You know, the impact this is going to have on the significant other or the relationship or, you know, afraid of having to uproot the family or downsize or live in I can't afford a prison, Uh, afraid of going backwards, afraid of the humiliation and embarrassment of getting to the top of the mountain only to slide down the other side. There's so many different fears we have in life, right? And our ego can play with us because our ego is all about our, our, you know, making sure we look good and avoid looking bad right? It's all about protecting our image. And we chase after false saviors, right? False saviors of money, false saviors of fame, fortune, acclaim, security in these outside things. We get our security from our money or our prestige or our reputation or what people think. We get our security from our bank account. We get our security from where we are in the rankings at our company. We get our security from you know whether or not people affirm us. And so there's all these outside false saviors, again, coping mechanisms that have empty promises that don't deliver. We think that if we get to a certain level, then we'll be happy. And then we realize that's not really the source of happiness. It might be the source of celebration for a moment, but it doesn't have longevity, does it? It has a hollow, empty promise. It does not deliver long term. And so we chase these false saviors. And then we have fear because those false saviors get dismantled. Those rugs get pulled out from underneath us. We have a pandemic. We're stuck in quarantine. The things that worked before don't work anymore. Our methods are not working. We're banging our heads against the wall with fruitless toil that steals our peace because we're in frustration mode. We're pissed off watching other people kicking ass and taking names while we're on the sidelines, picking up crumbs, wondering what the frick, why can't I figure it out? Why can't I get this right? We beat ourselves up. I should be doing more. I should be doing better. I should be further ahead. And then we wonder why we feel shitty because We're shooting all over ourselves with all the things we expect from ourselves that we're not delivering on. We have promises that we have to ourselves that we're not delivering on. And that can create unrest. That can create self beat up. That can uh, create inner turmoil. So focusing on fear has many different faces, but one thing in common, it's focusing on what we don't want. It's using the gift of our imagination against ourselves. It's the misuse of our imagination. Now, does that mean we should all be lollipops, unicorns, rainbows, sunny skies, and always just be positive all the time? No, we got to confront the issue. Like I said before, we have to confront the truth. It's called accurate thinking. It's not pessimism. It's accurate thinking to step into the light of truth and continue to step in the light of truth. That takes courage. So it's not about being the ostrich, putting our head in the sand and just being airy, fairy, positive all the time. We have to exercise accurate thinking 
and critical thinking. And we have to call it tight with ourselves because if we BS ourselves, guess what? That's a prison of our own making. And if we BS ourselves, how are we going to ever step into the power that comes from living in the truth if we're living in a lie ourselves? So that is the first place of power is telling ourselves the truth, but the truth doesn't necessarily have to be in fear. The truth doesn't have to be hopeless. A lot of times people get into that fear mode and they feel hopeless. They feel a a place of despair and depression where they kind of go full-blown Eeyore, right? And they just get in that really sulky, really depressed, tail between one's legs, sucking one's thumb, you know, curling up in the fetal position, feeling sorry for themselves kind of posture. And that is definitely the sign of fear. That is a symptom of fear and being towed around by fear and being at the effect of circumstance, playing to the bitch of circumstance. That is, again, a symptom of being towed around by the nose, by fear. And at the end of the day, it really comes down to a choice. I used to, I remember having many seasons in my life where I wasn't getting the result. I was up to my eyeballs in debt. I was putting in all this time, energy, and money, not getting the result. And I felt inadequate. I felt like a failure. And I felt this imposter syndrome just raising its ugly head inside my soul. And I remember how much it just leached my power, leached my joy, leached my peace. It had me feeling like just a fraction of who I was called to be. And I just felt so inadequate. I felt like I was a pigeon instead of being the eagle I was called to be. I was just being that pigeon, just scratching around in the pigeon yard instead of soaring like the eagle I knew that I was called to be. And so that contrast had me feeding the fire of fear in my own mind. And meaning always produces emotion because emotion is just energy in motion. So when we put meanings on our experiences that are disempowering, we get disempowering emotions because emotion always follows meaning. So one of the things that you're probably, if you're feeling fearful right now, chances are you're applying consciously or unconsciously. Usually it's unconscious. If you're anything like me, you're unconsciously applying a a meaning to that experience, to that challenge, to that adversity that has you feeling smaller than your circumstance, has you feeling powerless to your circumstance, has you feeling inadequate to your circumstance, true or not true, right? So the meaning we place to it determines the feeling we get from that experience, from that event. It's the interpretation. It's not the actualization of your circumstance, but the interpretation of your circumstance that determines how you show up in the face of the circumstance, either empowered or disempowered. So fear, we either live in one or two worlds at any given point in any given day. We either are living in fear or faith. Fear is projecting worst case scenario into your future. Faith is projecting best case scenario into your future. And it's not enough just to hope. Hope is great if you're in prison, right? If you're in prison, it's great to have hope. Because, I mean, if without hope, you're in total despair. But it doesn't make for a very good marketing plan, does it? We don't want you smoking the hope dope. We don't want you hoping. We want you knowing. Again, that's where certainty and confidence comes from. You need to have more than just hope. Otherwise, you're in hope prison, hoping your business is going to turn around, hoping that you're going to close some deals hoping that you're going to attract some partners. Hope is not enough. We need to have you standing in certainty, in confidence. And we're going to talk in a moment how you can cultivate that confidence powerfully. The third confidence killer is breaking promises, in particular and especially with oneself. Breaking promises. You see, if you say you're going to wake up at 5 a.m. and you don't, you broke a promise with yourself. If you say you're going to call 10 realtors a day and you don't, you're breaking a promise with yourself. If you say that you're going to eat healthy and you're just binging on junk food, you're breaking a promise with yourself. So it's in breaking promises to ourselves that has us 
not only corrode our identity as a champion, as a winner, as someone who stands in power to create what they want in their life by virtue of the power of their word. When they say it, they freaking mean it. Their word is law. But when we break promises, we corrupt and erode and undermine our personal power. That's how we kill our confidence. Unknowingly, unknowingly and unwittingly, we undermine and dismantle our confidence because we take the path of least resistance. We make excuses. We tell ourselves BS lies. We rationalize. We ration lies to our mind on how we can't, how we won't, how we didn't. And so we make these excuses that kill our confidence. So one of the ways we unwittingly kill our confidence is breaking promises to ourselves by allowing ourselves to be infected with excusitis and procrastinationitis, where we don't deliver on what we said to ourselves. And then when we don't deliver to what we said to ourselves, what we promised to ourselves, guess what happens next? We start to do it to others too. When we, make, when we break promises to others, guess what the, the first step in breaking promises to others is? Breaking promises to ourselves. And on the flip side, guess what the prerequisite is to deliver on your promises to others? Cultivate a habit of keeping promises to yourself. If you will cultivate that habit with yourself, it's all about you standing in identity by virtue of repetition and habit, making it part of your lifestyle, making it a muscle that you build through repetition, repetition, repetition of Having this knowing that when you freaking say you're going to do something, you freaking deliver on it, period, that your word has power because you've cultivated a habit of honoring your promises to yourself. Does that make sense, guys? I know this is not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. As the late and great Jim Rohn once said, it's easy to do, but it's also easy not to do, right? It's easy to honor a promise to yourself to wake up at 5 a.m. to go to the gym but it's also easy not to, right? If you got paid $10,000 to wake up one time to go to the, to go to the gym at 5 a.m., you, you wouldn't have any hesitation or any qualms or any resistance whatsoever, would you? You'd be bouncing out of bed like you were spring freaking loaded, right? You wouldn't have to scrape yourself out of bed with a spatula. You'd be doing it like that. Why? $10,000 cash just for waking up at 5 a.m. one time? Come on now, that's... That's the no-brainer of the freaking year, right? But the problem is we don't have that kind of instant gratification, right? You got to wait, you know, 12 weeks of grinding in the gym, cl gym and clanging and banging in the moaning, yoning while everyone else is sleeping and swimming against the current of average that wants you to feed yourself an excuse. Oh, not today. I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, it's too hard. I'm not in the mood. I'm too tired. I don't feel like it. And so we're constantly swimming up current against the current of average that wants to pull us back into our comfort zone. And you've got to literally swim upstream every single day for like 12 weeks before you really see any significant muscle from that habit. Sure, you're going to get stronger after week one, but you're going to be sore as freaking hell and you're going to see no gains. Sure, you're going to be a little stronger after week two, but you're going to be sore as freaking hell and you're not going to see much gains. So it's the delayed gratification that you have to get past and do it even though you don't necessarily see the full fruit from it because you feel better about yourself in embracing the process in being committed to the process that when you look at yourself in the mirror, it's like, man, that's a freaking champion right there. Someone who says he or she is going to do it and he or she freaking delivers on it, right? So the opposite of that is breaking one's promises to oneself and making that a habit. And you wonder why you feel like shit. You wonder why you don't have confidence. You wonder why it's hard to honor your word because that is a habit to do or not do, to deliver or not to deliver because you're either building soul strength or you're building soul weakness. There is no in-between. You're either growing or you're dying. There is no in-between. So 
Let's talk about cultivating massive confidence, shall we? Let's talk about three keys to cultivating massive confidence. Confidence builder number one is identity. Identity. I like to think of identity is kind of like a thermostat. If you have your thermostat set at 75 degrees and you're in the middle of summer and someone leaves a window or a door open, what happens? All of a sudden that hot air flows in your house and what happens? All of a sudden the sensors pick up that it's getting hot in here and your AC kicks on and it dials the temperature back down to 75 degrees. On the flip side, if it's winter time and someone leaves a window or door open and all that cold air comes in, what happens? The sensors notice that now it's getting colder than 75 degrees. So what happens? It kicks on the furnace and now bring the heat such that it goes back to 75 degrees. Same thing with us. If you're used to making $100,000 a year and all of a sudden you start making $150,000 a year and you haven't changed your identity, your set point of what you believe you're capable and worthy of, what's going to happen? You're going to self you're going to start to self sabotage. You're going to start to slough off. You're going to start to take days off. You're going to start scrolling on social media instead of getting to work. You're going to stop doing the prospecting activities you once did. All of a sudden the air conditioning comes on, you go right back to your set point. 75 degrees, aka $100,000 a year. Sound familiar? And on the flip side, let's say that you start to slough off such that now you're on a trajectory to make 50 to 75K a year, a year when you're used to making 100K per year. Now, all of a sudden, you start feeling uncomfortable. You feel the dissonance of your results in comparison to your identity, what you believe you're capable and worthy of. Your set point is no longer your results. There's a dissonance between your results and your set point. Now, what happens? All of a sudden, the furnace kicks on and you start getting out there, beating the bushes for business. You start doing more prospecting. You start getting your shit in gear in terms of making things happen. And all of a sudden, your pipeline starts to build. You start getting more deals in the hopper. Next thing you know, you're right back to what? Your set point of $100,000 a year. Sound familiar? Your identity is a big piece of your confidence. Because if you have an identity that feels lack of confidence around sales or lack of confidence around working with realtors or lack of confidence around being a good money manager or lack of, lack of confidence when it comes to prospecting or lack of confidence when it comes to fill in the blank, when it comes to what's required to build your business, you're going to find that as long as you believe it, it's like what Henry Ford once said, whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. You become that self-fulfilling prophecy. So our identities tend to be prisons of our own making because we don't realize that this cybernetic mechanism, if you haven't read Max Mel Walt's book, Max, Maxwell Waltz, um, I'm saying it wrong, but if you look up his book, Cybernetics, Psycho-Cybernetics, it's a fascinating read. And it talks about this autopilot system of our set point and how we rarely exceed our set point. Our results in life will rarely exceed that which we believe we're capable of and worthy of. So let me ask you this, what do you feel you're capable and worthy of? Chances are the best way to determine what you feel you're capable and worthy of is looking at your results over the last three years. If your results have been around $150,000 a year, that's what you believe in your heart. Con not consciously, but unconsciously in your subconscious mind, what you believe you're capable and worthy of. If you've made half a million a year and you've been doing that for the last 10 years, that's what you believe you're capable and worthy of. If you've been making a million dollars a year and you've been doing that for the last three to five years, chances are that's your set point. That's what you believe you're capable and worthy of. So of course, the, the question begging to be asked is how do we dial up your set point? How do we Change it from 75 degrees to 80 degrees to 90 degrees. How do we raise your set point so you're no longer self-sabotaging yourself? Very good question. I'm glad you asked. It's all about conditioning your subconscious mind. 
through visualization, through affirmations, and through associations. Because as the saying goes, your income five years from now will about, be about the same as what it is now, with the exception of the books you read, the people you hang out with, and the seminars you attend. And so it's the association of being with people who raise your set point by, by virtue of emulation and aspiration, people who are worthy of emulation, people that have results and fruits on their tree that inspire you to aspire to raise your standards, to raise your set point, to raise your identity of what you believe you're capable and worthy of. So your identity is a huge piece. When you give thanks in advance for your dream and you make that your habit and you visualize it, your subconscious mind doesn't know the difference of something vividly imagined and reality. It doesn't know the difference. So by visualizing and giving thanks for your dream in advance and getting connected to what it looks like, smells like, tastes like, sounds like, feels like, to have your dream now as if it's already real, your subconscious mind doesn't know the difference. And so when you get fully associated with that, it raises your identity because your subconscious mind doesn't know the difference. It thinks you're already making that money, living that lifestyle, creating that life of freedom, creating that massive impact in the world. It thinks you're already there because you vividly imagined it as if it's already real. Same thing with affirmations. When you say, I'm so happy and grateful, now the money comes to me in ever-increasing quantities through multiple sources of income on a continuous basis. Yes, and you say it with passion and conviction. Guess what? Your subconscious mind must express that which has been impressed upon the soil of your subconscious mind. So when you believe something and you affirm it with conviction and with passion and certainty, that seed has to, by virtue of cause and effect, take root and bear fruit in your subconscious mind. And whatever is impressed upon your subconscious mind must be expressed through your body in action, must be expressed in your emotions through a vibrational frequency, must be expressed through events, occurrences, and circumstances that conform and are in sync with the frequency that you're vibrating at. If you're vibrating in a frequency of victory, you're going to get victorious results. If you're vibrating in a frequency of lack, limitation, scarcity, you're going to get lack, limitation, scarcity results. If you're vibrating in a frequency of abundance, you're going to get abundant results. If you're vibrating in a frequency of fear, you're going to get fearful results. So whatever you transmit is what you're going to create more of. And so your identity is literally the blueprint. It's the autopilot set point that determines on autopilot what you're going to create more of in your life. So if you want to be a Scotsman's Guide top producer, you've got to start to condition your subconscious mind that you're already a Scotsman's Guide top producer. You've got to see it and feel it and taste it and smell it and touch it so vividly in relaxed visualization where you're just completely surrendered to the moment, totally relaxed and allowing your subconscious mind to steep in that reality as if it's already yours now. You do that through repetition, 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 repetition. And eventually that seed is going to take root and bear fruit in your life by virtue of being lodged in your subconscious mind. And when you achieve it, it's not going to be like, man, this is a real surprise. I didn't think this was going to happen. No, it's going to be like, man, I've visualized this so many times. Of course, it's going to happen. It's just who I am. I was already a Scotsman's Guide top producer well before it happened. I was just waiting for my bank account and my rankings to catch up with me, right? That's the power of visualization. That's the power of raising your identity. Let's talk about the next one. Confidence builder number two, keep promises to yourself. We talked about that earlier, right? Keep those promises to yourself. So when you say you're going to go to the gym Monday to Friday, you do whatever freaking takes. If you have a bad sleep, you say, hey, I'm going to need the gym even more because I'm going to be tired as hell. I need the gym to raise my frequency, raise my metabolism, raise my energy so that I can get through the day, not just get through the day, but get from the day. So the excuse before of, oh, man, I'm tired. I'm not going to go to the gym. That's what I used to tell myself. Now, when I'm tired as hell and I don't sleep well, it's like I need the gym more than ever before. Same thing with prospecting, right? Prospecting is like, man, I'm only going to go prospect when I have the luxury of time. 
Now it's like, I own, I prospect every day, period. Cause I know if I don't prospect, my business is going to start to regress. If I don't prospect, I'm going to go backwards. Prospecting is a non-negotiable must. So if I'm busy, that means I need to prospect even more because otherwise I'm not going to have the rocket fuel, the rocket to hire a team. I won't have the income. I won't have the consistency to be able to hire a team with the expenses that come from that if I'm only going to prospect when I have time. Because otherwise, it's the up and down yo-yo, right? Up one month, down the next. Up one month, down the next. It's that up and down yo-yo that has us being in that place where we, frankly, are constantly in this roller coaster ride from hell. And we can't get out of that roller coaster ride from hell unless we prospect every single day, Monday to Friday. Now, most people, they'll learn from these so-called coaches out there that get them to cold call the same 40 freaking realtors every Monday. That's doing it the hard way. Why would you want to call everyone on Monday when everyone else is calling on Monday? If there's one day to miss cold calling realtors, if there's one way to miss not reaching out to realtors, if there's one day you don't want to call realtors, it's on a Monday because everyone else is doing the same old thing. And if you want to be the top dog, you want to be zigging while everyone else is zagging. So make promise to yourself and keep it. doesn't mean you have to be perfect. You can give yourself grace if you trip, if you're not feeling well, if you feel sick, we need to give ourselves grace. Sometimes we're too hard on ourselves. And you know, here's a great question for you. If the voice in your head, the self-talk in your head was the voice of a coach, would it be a coach worth hiring? Would you want to hire a coach like that? Chances are, if they're beating you up, if they're shaming you, if they're guilting you, if they're beating you over the head with a stick, they would not be worth the time and the money to hire them as a coach. You know it and I know it. But so often we beat ourselves with our own stick and we have so much vitriolic abuse upon ourselves because we think that beating ourselves up is going to get us in line. We think beating ourselves up is going to get us to perform. We think beating ourselves up is going to get more juice from the fruit, but it doesn't. It dries up the fruit because it gets us living in fear, not faith. It gets us in contraction instead of expansion. It gets us in adrenaline and cortisol, which is actually great if you're running from the saber-toothed tiger. It's great if you're running from the lion, but it's not great to live a life of abundance, of peace, of power, of poise. You're never going to get to peace, power, and poise on adrenaline, pumping cortisol in your bloodstream, because that is the fight, flight, or freeze type of energy. That's never going to get you there. We need to get you in serenity. The more you surrender, the more you source serenity and strength. So we want to get you in that serenity place because that's how you soar. The more you get into serenity, the more you soar. And keeping promises to yourself is the one of the ways you can source that. Start with one thing. Start with one habit that you're going to cultivate. Maybe it's an hour of power of prospecting every day, Monday to Friday. Maybe it's going to the gym a little earlier, getting out of bed a little earlier and going to the gym. Maybe it's going and riding your bike in the morning. Maybe it's making your bed in the morning. Just simply a simple, so, something as simple as just making your bed. But it's something that you promise to yourself, not because you have to, but because you get to. You get to build muscle. You get to source soul strength. You get to step into your power. You get to create the life that you want by design versus drifting by default. And the way you do that, the way you sculpt your life, just like you sculpt your body, is the discipline of honoring promises to yourself. That's how you build confidence. That's how you build competence because the only way you're going to build competence is through repetition, repetition, repetition. Repetition is the mother of all learning, father of all skill, and the birthplace of all mastery. Dabblers get mediocre results. Masters get extraordinary results. So how do we become masters of what we do? How do we build mastery little level confidence? We build mastery level confidence from mastery level competence. But at the beginning, 
we suck, right? At the beginning, it's like every master was once a disaster. At the beginning, the first is always the worst. So you have to be willing to do a bad before you get good at it. You've heard the saying, if you're not going to do it right, what? Don't do it at all. That's complete hogwash. That's a great way, way, by the way, to live a mediocre life. Don't live based on that principle because that principle will keep you in the muck and mire of mediocrity. Instead, say this, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly before I get good at it. It's worth doing poorly before I get good at it. So that's confidence builder number two. Keep promises to yourself. The third is seek progress, not perfection. Seek progress, not perfection. So often we get into this paralysis by analysis, this perfectionism prison of having to have everything just polished and perfect. The problem with that is there's only one standard for perfection. There's only one person who can be perfect, and that's God. Everyone else falls way short right? There's only one being in the universe that is perfect and it ain't us. All of us fall way short. And so perfection is actually the lowest standard. Perfection is a standard we can't actually live by because us humans, we're always going to fall short of perfection. So if you have a perfectionism bent, I'm here to tell you that's a very low standard because it's not a standard we can attain. I submit to you a better way to grow, a better way to achieve outcomes, a better way to live a life on purpose with purpose and prosperity is to seek progress, not perfection. Seek progress, not perfection. Just get a little better every day. The goal is to just get a little better every day. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Earl Nightingale said that. Such a beautiful definition for success, is it not? Success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. What does that say? It's really speaking to embracing the process. Embrace the process and the prize takes care of itself. Embrace the process of becoming the best version of yourself. Embrace the process of stepping out of your comfort zone. And taking risks, because without risk, there is no reward. Embrace the process of getting into the dojo of preparation, knowing that success is when preparation meets opportunity. It's how you prepare in the dark room of preparation that determines how you show up and shine on the stage of performance when it really counts. So embrace the process. Embrace the process of the inspiration that is really built based on perspiration that creates the transformation. It's the perspiration, not just the inspiration, but the perspiration of doing what you need to do in the implementation that creates the transformation. So embrace that process. And give yourself the grace to fumble. Give yourself the grace to make mistakes. You know, you want to know what the secret to success is? Is fail forward fast. Fail forward fast. That means failure is not an identity. It's an event. Failure, if you fail, that doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means you have an opportunity to start again more intelligently. You learned what didn't work. You got new awareness, new distinction on what didn't work. So you can start again more intelligently with what does work, right? So it's like Thomas Edison, he said, when he created the the incandescent light bulb and reporters like, wow, you took 10,000 attempts and all of them were failures. No, they weren't failures. I just found out what didn't work. They're portals to new discovery to find out what didn't work so I can find out what would work. Every one of them gave me new clues. Every one of them gave me new distinctions. Every one of them gave me new awareness. I would not have created the incandescent light bulb had I called called them failures and felt sorry for myself and contracted based on the fact that I had a disempowering meaning of failure. I didn't see them as failures. I saw them as feedback another opportunity to start again more intelligently. Notice how that builds confidence. 
Notice how that allows him to build competence that breeds confidence by failing forward fast. So if you're listening to this, you're watching this, you're like, Dorn, I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down. I appreciate the fact you've been vulnerable and real. I appreciate you sharing your humanity and being courageously vulnerable with me because I can relate to your story. I can relate to your insecurities and feelings of inadequacy. I can relate to the fears you've had of not being enough, imposter syndrome, et cetera. And I need more confidence for my life, my business, not just in this market, but in every market. I've noticed that I've been picking the low-hanging fruit with the refi boom over the last two years. I've been getting complacent. I've been drifting. I've been picking that low-hanging fruit, thinking this was always going to be, knowing in my heart that the storm was going to come, but I just didn't think it was going to come this quick. And here I am now, my business is going backwards. I'm noticing my pipeline drying up. My revenues are drying up. I'm having a hard time getting in front of these realtors. The realtors are not giving me the time of day. I know I'm leaving a ton of money on the table on my database. I don't really have the most productive daily action plan. I know I'm leaking and hemorrhaging opportunity left, right, and center. I know that I'm capable of more. I know I'm called to more. If that's you, welcome to the club. You're in good company. That's why smart, ambitious, growth-minded mortgage professionals hire us, is to learn the secret sauce and how to unleash the beast within, how to step into your greatness, how to work smarter, not just harder, and how to step into the best version of yourself. You see, because your self-concept determines your self-confidence and the gap between the way you see yourself and your life and how you feel you should be living your life and who you think you should be at this stage in your life. The gap between the way you see yourself and your true potential and the results you currently have and the dissonance between those two anchor points is the determinant of your level of confidence. And if there's a big gap between how you're showing up in the world and how you think you should be showing up in the world, that leaks confidence. That corrodes your confidence. So if you're in that place and you feel like, man, I need to, I need to man up, woman up. I need to champion up. I need to have someone in my corner who knows how to call out my greatness, who, know, who knows how to remind me the champion that I am and call that champion out in me, who calls it tight, who gives me some tough love if necessary, who holds me to a higher standard, who plugs me into a circle of champions that calls out my greatness, that inspires me into greatness, to give me examples worthy of emulation, and to give me rocket fuel in my rocket to step up my game, to become the best version of myself. If that's you, and you know that what you're doing right now is not even scratching the surface of the surface of what you're capable of and called to, and you know that doing what you've been doing is just going to keep getting what you've been getting, and you know that there's a next level for you, there's a version of yourself that is more powerful, more prosperous, more peaceful, and more on purpose than the way you've been living. And you want to bridge that gap so that you're stepping into that best version of yourself who's in your power every day, who's in your peace every day, who's stepping into more and more prosperity every day, not just in terms of your bank account, but also in terms of your peace, poise, power, purpose, and living in those higher level of vibrations, of emotions that has you knowing you're living your best life, your best self. If that's you and you're wanting to learn how to take things to the next level with a coach in your corner who can shine the light of truth in your situation and reveal your blind spots. Because when you're inside the bottle, it's hard to see the label. And you know you need a champion level coach in your corner to help you get champion level results. Then I invite you to take advantage of a complimentary breakthrough call by going to mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. That's mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. Go ahead and book a call either with myself or one of my consultants, we'll lift up the hood on your business. We'll look at what's working, what's not working. Where are you at now? Where do you want to be? And if we can help you create a breakthrough in your business, by all means, we'll show you what that looks like. 
If not, we'll be the first to advise you to pass. But either way, you will leave that meeting with massive value, massive clarity. Chances are we're going to have some fun. Fair enough. So if that sounds good to you, and it definitely should, go ahead and book a call at mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. This is Dorn Aldana coming at you from the Art of Mortgage Marketing Podcast. I trust you got some value, some distinctions, perhaps some just healthy reminders. As Tony Robbins once said, we often need reminding more than we need educating. So maybe you got some healthy reminders. Maybe I got you doing some soul searching. I hope I gave you a, some, a, a certain degree of unrest, a certain degree of cage rattling where you got uncomfortable to the point where you feel like you need to do something and spurred into action with some intelligent, strategic action towards some of the things we shared today, which was take and make promises to yourself and keep them. Make promises to yourself and keep them. Build that identity as a champion and focus on faith, not fear. Focus on what you want to create in your life, but don't turn your back on the truth. Take extreme ownership of the truth. Have the courageous vulnerability and humility to step into the light of truth, to exercise accurate thinking, not delusional optimism. That being said, y'all, one thing I know for certain, you were made by greatness for greatness. God didn't make any junk. He didn't start with you. So may you know that to your core. May you know that that dream in your heart is not there to tease you or to tempt you, but to call it the best in you. I trust that As you listen to this, as you watch this, you know there's no accident while I'm speaking to your soul, while I'm speaking to your heart. You know that you have a high and mighty calling on your life. And you know that in order for you to tap your full potential, you need to surround yourself with people who call that champion out in you. And it would be a delight and a joy to serve you if indeed you feel open to that next step in creating a breakthrough in your life and your business. Not just open, but committed. If you're in that place, book a call, mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. All right, my friends, that's all we got for this particular session. I trust you got some value from it. Get after it, my friends. Go and take massive action. Bring massive positive energy to that action. Chances are you're going to get massive results. We'll see you soon. Cheers.